Rose is on the altar this morning because we had a birth this week. Um, Rachel and Rob Bergen are proud parents of a little girl. So after two boys, that was nice. Not that there's anything wrong with boys. Uh, our gospel lesson this morning is Jesus' uh, steps for reconciling uh, someone who has wronged you. So we'll talk about that and see what that means for us. Uh, and today we're going to have a temple talk while the offering is being gathered. Lucy Stilwell will tell you about some changes that are happening in our worship. Let's prepare our hearts for worship through the brief order of confession and forgiveness. It's found on the third page of your bulletin. Please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the sovereign over all the earth, the wisdom from on high, our merciful judge and savior. Let us boldly approach the throne of grace, trusting in God's mercy and love. Generous and faithful God, we confess to you all the ways, known and unknown, that we reject and undermine your steadfast love. Though you made us as your people, we treat strangers with suspicion. Though you forgive our debts, we collect without mercy. Yet we are quick to pass judgment on others. Have mercy on us, O God, and remember your promise to us for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the, the, our God will stand forever. Through the living word, Jesus Christ, God forgives your every debt, your every sin, and gives you a new heart and a new spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace by greeting those around you.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. O oh Lord God, enliven and preserve your church with your perpetual mercy. Without your help, we mortals will fail. Remove far from us everything that is harmful and lead us toward all that gives life and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
A reading from Ezekiel. So you, mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked ones, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity. But their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now you, mortal, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have said, Our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live, turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? The word of the Lord. reading from Romans. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the love of one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Jesus said, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. 
If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take two or one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I would like uh, the young people to come forward. Good morning. Why don't you come over here? Yes, yeah, so you can see my my whiteboard. We're going to do some math. How many of you started school well a couple weeks ago, didn't you? All right. This is a math problem. 1 plus 1 equals what? 2. Two. Did you know? Vince Strand, if he were here today, he would say, by definition, it equals two. So one, by, one plus one equals two by definition. That's what they'll teach you in school, and that's a good thing to learn. But whenever you come to church, and especially learn something from Jesus, math sometimes gets a little fuzzy. And Jesus said, one plus one can equal three. Do you think that's possible? Here's what Jesus said. When two or three people are gathered together in his, in his name, he is there with them. So if two people are gathered together in Jesus' name, he'll show up. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of you up here. We can always add one. Because we're gathered in Jesus' name. Jesus is here too. So there's really eight. Oh, I could include myself in there. So eight up here, and we'll make change this to nine. So no matter how many people are in the sanctuary, when we're gathered in Jesus' name, we can always add one. Okay? <laughs> Good. That's your math lesson for today. Math according to Jesus. Let us pray. Repeat after me. Gracious God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he's here today. And any time two or more people gather in his name, in his name we pray. All right, you can go back to your seats. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It's been a busy week. Of course, we had Monday off, or at least I had Monday off. 
Tuesday, I had jury duty, and thankfully I was released in the afternoon. Um, David Gilbert had to, had to stay. And then I uh, had a memorial service this week, and then God's work, our hands, went on yesterday, and we had a, a pretty successful morning. The dumpster got filled, and you saw the pile of brush. We really encouraged people to clean up their yards with this thing. Hate to think how much work it's going to be to get that brush out of here, though. Forgive me for uh, mentioning the Simpsons in this, in this sermon, but we will... Um, but there's an absolute, by the way, the Simpsons, did you know, they have the distinction of being the most church-going family in TV history. Have you ever watched a TV program and seen people go to church? Leave it to Beaver. They never went to church. I mean, at least it was never mentioned that they went to church. The Simpsons go to church all the time. Sometimes their conclusions are not always what uh, make us I, I feel good. Uh, they, they sometimes poke fun of the church, but sometimes uh, uh, they're well-meaning about it. But there was an episode of The Simpsons where we see Homer, the dad, and the two oldest children, Bart and Lisa running into the house, tearing off their clothes as they ran in, throwing them down, and Marge, the mom, says, don't do that, you're going to wrinkle your Sunday clothes. And Bart says, oh, don't say that, this is the best part of the week. And then Lisa explains that. This is the moment, the longest moment we have, the longest time before we have to go back to church. And that's when the mom, Marge, says, don't say that. Church shouldn't be a chore. It should be a help in your daily life. And Homer says, it should be, but it doesn't. But it, it should be a help in our daily lives, but it doesn't. It doesn't help. Well, we might, uh, some of you might agree with Homer at times. One of the problems with Homer is he's, uh, of course, also one of the least reflective people we have in TV. Uh, Today's gospel lesson, though, is extremely practical. And it is one of those things that should help us in our daily lives in a great way. Let's look at the context. Oh, oh by the way, this text is often used in the church. For church discipline, it's about who we should kick out of church. But when you look at the context, it's just the opposite. It's about who and how we can include people, restore people, reconcile people, deal with people. And we see that in the context, and, and we can see how important it is. Right before this text, we have the parable of the lost sheep. Remember the parable? The way Matthew tells it is that a shepherd had 100 sheep, one gets lost, he leaves the 99 sheep unprotected to go find the one sheep. That one sheep is so important, he leaves the 99 unprotected. And Jesus likens that to the kingdom, that each person is that valuable, is that important. Well, then we come to this text. You can see reconciliation and restoring 
is what this text then is about. And then when this text ends, why do we want people to be restored? Two reasons. Because when two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, he's there in their midst. The presence of Christ in our midst is what's at, at risk. And secondly, prayers get answered. Ask and you will receive. And it seems to all be about this business of reconciliation and having people together in your midst. So let's look at the practical steps that Jesus gives. He, um, let me just say one thing. Is it not hard to talk to a friend about a fault they may have or something that has to, to happen? Let me give you an example. I, I was really distressed by this. I don't know why. But the news of a young man who was uh, arrested for driving while intoxicated, thrown in jail. A friend comes that very night, bails him out, and on the way home, the friend drops the person who was drunk off at his car. The person who was drunk then gets in his car, drives home, has an accident, kills two people. Who did they arrest and charge? It wasn't the person who was driving drunk that time. It was his friend who put him behind the wheel. So now we have ads that say, friends don't let friends drive drunk. Why can't we tell someone who's a friend, oh, you've had too much to drink, let me call you a cab, or let me drive you home, or maybe you should walk, the walk will do you some good. friends that we have a hard time. Jesus tells us to love our enemies. And some people feel, well, he didn't say to love our friends. First rule Jesus gives. If anyone has wronged us, go and, well, tell that person, speak it, put Put our complaint into, the wor into words. Very often, just putting our complaint into words helps us deal with it. It puts it in perspective. It, um, it sometimes cools us down. Sometimes, it helps us realize how petty we may be. Uh, Gerhard Frost, who uh, was a college, or uh, seminary professor and poet. And he wrote a commentary on, on uh, Job. And in that commentary, well, it's a book on Job. He gives little stories and poems about uh, his reflections. And at the introduction of the book, he tells of a, a young boy who... Um, who he says, Grandma, and Grandma says, yes. It's been a bad day, a really bad day, Grandma. I lost my best friend, and the teacher made me sit by myself because she thought I talked too much. On my way home, I made a snowball, and I threw it. I told God I hope it hit him right in the heart. But after a while, I told him I was sorry, and things got a little better. One of the things that you learn from reading the prophets is that they had no problem telling God how angry and upset they were with him. But putting things into words seems to help us feel better. Gerhard Frost then says, then says this, I too have made my snowball and thrown it at God, but I have heard the good news, and I believe there is more than power and intelligence behind this world. There is love, there is heart, 
everything happening on this broken planet with its sin-battered children hits God right in the heart. Put it into words. Second, we're advised to go see the person face to face. Go personally. One of the things I uh, find that uh, email and, and text messages are sometimes poor ways to communicate. There's a couple of reasons for that. Sometimes people don't check their email very often. But have you ever noticed how we've come up with all these little symbols? The smiley face, you know, if you say something and go, oh boy, that doesn't sound right. You put a smiley face by it and it makes it all right. Jesus says, speak face to face. Face to face, sometimes. It's in those face to face encounters that we realize what we were so angry about or what they were so angry about doesn't really matter. Face to face. Um, we may have misread, misunderstood the situation. It's not to humiliate or condemn. It's to talk. Why? Uh, remember, when you go and talk face to face, it's about reconciliation. Too often we just write people off. I dealt with uh, a couple of people who had both written letters to, them, to one another about how upset they were with the other person. Each sat there holding the letter they received from the other. I've got this letter. I know how that person feels. There's no way they could talk with each other because it isn't about who's right and who's wrong. It's about reconciliation. Pastor Roy Burkhart told this story about a young boy who was told not to engage in a particular activity because it was dangerous, he did so anyway. He had an accident then, lost both legs. Parents rushed to the hospital, the boys laying in the, in the hospital room, and the parents, as soon as he saw his parents, he looked at them and he said, I am so sorry. Will you forgive me? And the, both parents ran up and hugged him and embraced him and said, oh, yes, we forgive you. And then he said, now I, can live, now I can live without my legs. Now I can live without my legs. Face to face. Something healing about that. Third step. Take some wise Christians with you. It's not to gang up on the person. Again, what is our goal here? What is Jesus' goal? What is God's goal? Reconciliation. Forgiveness. Not to prove the wrongdoing. And very often you bring people with you because they might side with the other person. They go, well, no wonder you are wrong. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that sometimes is our problem. Um, fourth step. If all that fails, take it to the church. Again, why? So people can engage in Christian prayer together because we're concerned about reconciling someone. We need to listen to one another. And then step four goes right with step five. Let that person be as a Gentile and a tax collector. It's interesting that this is in being written in the Gospel of Matthew. What was Matthew's occupation before he became a disciple? He was a tax collector. How did Jesus treat tax collectors? He never gave up hope. Goes and visits Zacchaeus and has supper with him. 
How many times in the Bible did it say, oh, Jesus went with the sinners and ate with them, the sinners and the tax collectors. Jesus never gave up on anyone, prayed constantly for them, worked with them. Matthew, in his example, is an example. Jesus called him as a disciple. So what does this scripture say to us? Well, our catechism talks about the keys of the kingdom. The church, you and I, have been given the keys to the kingdom. As this text says, whatever is bound on earth is bound in heaven. And whatever is loosed, whatever is forgiven on earth, is forgiven in heaven. That's powerful. And those words mean what they say. Jesus wants us to be his forgiving people. He died on the cross for our forgiveness. He wants us to model that in our lives. I'm thankful that I'm one of his forgiven children. I'm thankful whenever one of you forgives me. Our model needs to be forgiveness and love. Why? When people gather in Jesus' name, he is here in our midst. In Jesus' name. Then Jesus says, and when you pray and ask, you will receive. Amen.
living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. God of love, your church is a place of relationship. Give us understanding to care for you and each other with our whole hearts. Hear us, O oh God. God of love, our community and world is a precious gift. Turn our hearts to share. We thank you for all who work so hard during our day of caring. God's work, our hands. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of love, your desire for us is peace. We pray for those situations where there is no peace, where nation and would-be nation bargain over beheaded journalists in the Middle East. The thin skin of racial reconciliation being ripped in Ferguson. Families who have ruptured. Be with the courageous volunteers and committed health care workers as they expedite the development of an Ebola vaccine. Guide the overburdened and underappreciated peace workers negotiating a ceasefire in Ukraine. Give strength to relief workers straining to meet the challenges of refugees in Syria and flood-submerged villages in South Kashmir and the many others whom they represent. Lead us along paths of justice and give us delight in living with honor and loving our neighbor. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, your ways are goodness and life. Heal those suffering from fear and dread, loneliness and heartache, pain and disgrace, and those who need your healing touch. Especially Odella Arnold, Alton Burnell, Zach Drake, Gail Davidson, Betty Evans, Wilbur Dykeman, Samir Godfrey, Larry Hopper, Jim Lampy, Dorothy Lokensgaard, Elaine Mitchell, Wayne Myers, Katie Snath, and Mary Thomas. Are there any others? God of love, we thank you for all your good gifts. We give special thanks for the gift of babies. Bless Rob and Rachel Bergen and their baby girl. God of love, your promise to us is resurrection. Comfort those who mourn, especially the family and friends of Joanne Allen. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Trusting in your mercy and goodness, we bring before you these prayers and whatever else you see that we need. In the name of the one who sets us free, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Still, there we go. Um, I'm talking about two things this morning. Let's talk about the first thing is how we're going to be changing how we do offering. Usually at this time, some music's going on, and when the music's finished, then we sing an offertory response, and then after that comes an offertory prayer. Well, if you take time to look through all of the settings in our new Cranberry book that we've had for, what, five years, um, 
They don't do an offertory response, and there's really no need. When the ushers finish, while the music's still going on, they'll just bring it on up, and then the assisting minister will lead us in the offertory prayer. So that's that change. Not a big deal. It's just if you're on the shepherding team, don't wait for, you know, once you get the money in, bring it on up, okay? Now, the other thing is, and this is something we noticed when we started visiting other churches when our girls grew up and moved away, and thank goodness some of them have, one of them has come back. But anyway, um, other churches do the lay reading differently. Um, everybody else does it differently, so I think we're the ones that are different. Here, the custom has been that the assisting minister does everything, everything. They read, they read the responses, the prayer, they help with the prayers, and they read the scripture. But you go to other churches and they give the other folks an opportunity to read scripture. So the first and second lessons are read by someone who just simply comes up from the congregation um, and reads the scripture. And we're going to start instituting this. We'll have a training, not much to do, to learn. We're going to have a training next week uh, right after the first service. And the reason for changing to this is not just to be like everybody else, but there may be some folks who would love to have, to exercise that privilege of reading scripture for their fellow congregants, but they don't want to robe up. They don't want to not be able to sit with their family. They may be you know, you got a shaky hand, you don't feel like trying to serve communion and spill wine on folks. But doing it this way, we give opportunity to more of our members to be uh, take a more active part in the service. So it is really a privilege to be able to read scripture and it is an honor. And this way we can open it up to more people. So there will be a training right after the first service next week. And that's pretty much it. Okay. If I can add my two cents, it's not... Uh, it, it is more in line with the way other churches do it. When people go and visit their friends and other churches, they always say, hey, why don't we have leaders that come up? So other Lutheran churches, any church I've served, that's the way we used to do it. Um, so we're just bringing that into line with common practice. Will it work here? Who knows? Merciful God, as green scattered upon the hills were gathered together to become one bread, so let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. is ready. Our Lord invites us. Please come. You may be seated.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. The host at every meal, at this table you spread out a feast for all peoples, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Send us from this banquet to invite others into these good things, to let justice roll down like waters, and to care for the least of our sisters and brothers, through Jesus Christ, our Sovereign and our Savior. mentioned to you our um, God's work, our hands, the, the work we did yesterday right after the second service today is going to be a picnic, potluck, the whole works, so enjoy that. Um, the whole come back is what I'm trying to say. The uh, then I see Sarah and, s and I see Rose, uh, while they're getting their places, next week, 3.30 in the afternoon, I think it's 3.30, maybe it's 3 o'clock, the bishop is going to be here at Messiah for a meeting. All the other Area 8 congregations are invited to, uh, to come. They're, um, of course, the rostered leadership, pastors, and, and AIMS, and uh, PMAs, but anybody from the congregation is invited to come also and meet our Bishop Roger Gustafson and see what's happening in our synod. Um, we'll even feed you afterwards. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, well, we mentioned lay readers earlier. I just wanted to say um, that if you are at all interested, we have a sign-up sheet at the welcome desk, and if you could put down your name, that would be greatly appreciated. Thanks. And I just want to thank everyone who um, stayed out of the rain and helped with the quilting yesterday. We managed to get six quilts done, and we have two to go to meet our goal of 25. So we decided a week from this Wednesday, we're going to meet uh, from 5.30 till whenever to get those last quilts done. So if anyone is interested, we could use your hands. It's easy, and there's no training required, but we'll show you how. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Uh, one other announcement on behalf of the youth. I'll make this announcement. Next Saturday is the Youth Garage Sale. Starts at 6 a.m. to 3, a, 3 p.m. So um, keep that in mind. Receive this benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace that sustains every breath we take. The love of God that gives us courage and strength and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit that fills our hearts with comfort and peace be with you and all those you care about now and forever. Amen. Join 
joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love, hearts on fire, cloud, thee, their Son above, melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the gloom of doubt away, giver of unfortunate gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround the earth and have reflect thy rays, stars and angels sing around. Thank you. 